there thinking while he was, uh, while we were enjoying that, I was thinking about uh, how probably, it's probably been about 14 years ago, and uh, I was working as a plant manager in a place in Whittemore, and I was, I felt like I was stuck, because I really felt called into the ministry, and I was as a plant manager, and I didn't know how Oh God, how do I get from here? Because we're living in base, we're living in Essexville. I'm working in Whittemore. How do I get to here? I don't understand how I get from here to here. Well, God had this master plan. It was great. It was one day, one day. Um, basically, I was run. I had to run the shop as myself. There was nobody over me. One day, my boss, the owner, showed up with a gentleman, gave him a tour, and he introduces him now as the president of the company. He's my boss. Hello, thank you. All right. So. It starts to present itself, and I'd say about a week into this whole new adventure, um, the man calls me in on a Monday, at, which is a typical Monday. He calls me in, and he sits me down, and he says, <clears throat> I'm going to cut your pay in half, um, and you're going, to, um, you're going off salary, and you're going to have uh, full responsibilities that you had as a plant manager. <laughs> I can, can you guess some of the things that were running through my mind? Because I could see some of your faces, what you were thinking. There was murder, okay? I'm thinking there's not one other employee 150 feet from this guy right now. I could take him. But I'm thinking to myself, I was, I was I'm going to be honest, I was, wouldn't you be hot? I'm driving 55 miles one way, and you just cut my pay in half. I mean, there's just a lot of things. I've worked hard. I didn't deserve this. And I walked out of that meeting and I closed the door onto the shop floor because I'm going out to work, which I did anyway, but now it's just a different attitude. And I closed that door and I said to the Lord, I'm not doing anything he said. <laughs> and I heard the Lord as clear as day in that moment say, you're going to do everything he said and you're going to do everything I said that I tell you to do. I'm going to tell you when one year from that time, from that time of going to wanting to kill, which I'm kidding, just being sarcastic, to one of the last days that I worked there before he laid me off, generously, I guess, and I went into the ministry, is he called me up front to do, make a call for an employee to another customer because he had made a problem. He was making serious problems with our customer base. And he hands me the paperwork and says, I know, you're probably mad, you probably hate me. And the words that came out of my mouth next surprised me as well as him. I looked at him, I grabbed the paperwork, I said, I don't hate you, I love you. Awkward, but I'd like walk. I'm like, hmm. There was a lot of things the man did during this time. He, he, he belittled me. He belittled my faith. He made ma very sexual comments that were, I won't go into it. The, question, the, the, the point is here, it had nothing to do with what I deserved. It was what God wanted to build in me. God had to tear something down out of me to build me back up. Now, suffering is not fun. None of us like to suffer. Amen? But I'm going to tell you right now, if you could grasp the theory of what God has for suffering, you will, you will project yourself forward so much quicker. Instead of fighting him, instead of resisting him, like the song we just sang, if you just surrender to him, if we'd stop worrying about what we deserve and how hard we worked and what we did with this and how this and that and all that, and just surrender to his plan he has for us. How much quicker, how much better, how much you'd understand. Like Job says, I thought I knew you one way, but man, now I see you with my eyes. You're nobody. You're nothing what I thought you were. You're so much more. I can say that out of that experience, I understand that God can take care of me no matter what man does to me. No matter what God says against me, God is for me. And no matter how much hate people throw at you, you can learn to love your enemy and reflect him. Now listen to me. First Peter this morning. First Peter 4, starting in verse 12. It says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing has happened. It always seems strange when you go into it. You think, I've been, I've been going to church. I've been being nice. I've been doing good things. Why is this happening to me? Because God loves you. <laughs> it's not strange. We live in a fallen world, and this is, remember, a couple of weeks ago, I think it was, or last week, I can't remember which week I'm on, Jesus himself said, this isn't my kingdom. 
If it were my kingdom, my angels would have came and fought for me, and we'd be staying here. This isn't it. This isn't ours either. So what happens here, you have to understand that God is building you for something greater, a kingdom greater, preparing you, preparing me. It says, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Now, suffering and exceeding joy don't usually seem to go together, do they? But here they do. Today they do. He says, if you're reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he's blasphemed, because that's what they mean to do. But on your part, he's glorified. How important it is for us to grasp the persecution and trial and temptations, things that are thrown at us, to understand that God is building us, strengthening us. You ever see a batting cage? You know what a batting cage is, right? What do you go into a batting cage for? To get hit with a ball or to learn how to hit? You've got to learn. You've got to learn how to take the swing. And you're going to get hit. You've got to wear a helmet. God gives us a full armor of God, so we're good. You've got to learn to swing. But let none of us suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, don't be ashamed. You have nothing to be ashamed of. Though they mock you in front of others, you have nothing to be ashamed of. We look at the Olympics of what just happened. People are in an uproar. Is it a surprise? We live in a fallen world. I have nothing to be ashamed of God. There's a reason why they go after him, because he's genuine. The question has been, why aren't they pointing it at uh, Muslims and this and that? Because they aren't genuine. Christ is king, and that's who they're going to go after. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel? Judgment begins here. Well, isn't that the house? Yes, if you're part of the house, it begins with you. It begins with me. Judgment begins within me first. Suffering is not meant to make you angry or hard-hearted. That is not the whole point. God has not put his finger on you to hurt you, to harm you, to make you bitter. He's, he's saw, it's to soften your heart, to humble yourself. Like I, the song, I surrender. I'm just going to bow down. I'm just letting go of it all. I'm going to trust you. I don't like it. If there was an easy button, wasn't that? What was that easy button? Was that, who was that? Uh, staples? Yeah. If there was an easy button, you bet we'd hit it. You know, God says no to something. Where's the button, the yes button? We'd change it if we could. But why don't we surrender? In this world, we're taught to fight. But God says he'll fight for us. We surrender to him. That's when we become strong. When we surrender to what God is allowing to happen in our life the, through the suffering. If you could learn to look, get your bat out, Get your helmet on and get your glove on if you like that. I never wore the glove. But, and start getting the bass out into the batting cage and start practicing. And start practicing giving him praise. I'm not telling you that you should ask God to bring it. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying, praise God, bring more. I'm saying, in the midst of your suffering, know that he's for you, not against you. That he's walking you through this. How many examples do we have in the scripture? Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. He walked right through the fire with them. He met them in there. These, these stories were written not for fairy tales, not to make little cute children's books, or to make felt figures and put them on. It's for the adults too, to understand that what you're going through, when you're in the fire, he's there with you. You just got to stop the anxiety and look around and find him. You guys with me this morning? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Suffering is to learn to love like God and to understand how deeply loved you are by God. When I finished that little tidbit for me at Tawa Store, where I worked, I walked out with a better understanding of who God is in my life. 
I saw that I, it doesn't matter what. It doesn't matter what obstacles in the way. I stood out there and going, I could not believe how you could possibly get me from point A to point B. And swoop, let me show you, Steve. It is not the plan I would have picked. But I wouldn't change it now. Because there's so many elements in it where I just see God and he filled this hole, he filled that hole, he touched that in my life, he did this. I wouldn't change one thing. But if he'd have asked me to be prior, here's the plan. I got, this is going, you're going to get, what? No, no, we need to debate this. Like Job. Job said, Job was debating with God. I don't know, I, you know, you're jo I wish I wasn't even born. But God corrected him. If I'm your Lord, and you can, if you can answer any of these questions that he presented to Job, then maybe you're Lord. But I would encourage you to go back into about Job 40 and start looking at the list of questions God asked Job and see if you can come up with any of them. Too astounding, brilliant, incredible. None of us can. So we all come to terms, you know, we're all on the same level playing field right here, correct? We all understand that. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of God's glory. We're all human. We all need God. Therefore, we need to all surrender. Now, it says this in our suffering, 2 Corinthians 1.5. It says, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. What does that mean? That suffering brings comfort from the Lord. I just want you, but I'm so overwhelmed by my suffering. If we'd stop, surrender, focus on a couple weeks, I think it was, I can't remember what week it was, talking about him being high and lifted up and seeing God. Maybe it was last week, right? I'm getting old. I can't remember my weeks. I've seen all the, in Daniel, in Ezekiel, in Isaiah, Seeing God for who he is, not just praying like God is just out there in some, I don't know, mystic thing, but reading through scripture of exactly what God is doing and where he's at and what he's doing. Like right now, as I said back a week ago, he's in heaven, sitting high and lifted up on a throne, and he hears our prayers. He hears your cries. He knows your desperation. And around the throne are are angels and saints, and they're worshiping him. There is just, it's not boring. There's a lot going on. And I read those stories, and I'm like, how can he hear us with all that going on? You got seraphim, they're all spinning. There's holy, holy, holy. And they're just, they're only repeating what they see. Shouldn't we get a whiff of that? They're only repeating what they see. Holy, they just can't get past that part. We have to capture this vision of the scriptures and embrace them. That is what's going to save us and bring us and deliver us through some of our trials. Absorb his word. Believe his word to help carry you through your sufferings. Now, we read about Job this morning. We talked about Paul's suffering a couple weeks ago. So, something we learned from them is that Neither one of those guys were bitter. Their pain, their misery, their experiences, it didn't leave them bitter. Have you read Paul's letters? He isn't like yelling at the Philippians and yelling at everybody. You guys need to step it up and do it. He's, it's all love. God took them, those men, and he squeezed them. Well, that's mean. People don't like to hear that. God is loving. God is loving. But God is just. And God will bring the best out of us because God created us. I don't even know what's every, everything that's in me. But God does. God knows exactly. You know how you squeeze an orange or a lemon? You get every last drop? God's going to do that for you because he loves you. And we have to like, just surrender Romans 12, 9, it says this. It says, to let love be without hypocrisy. Now, this is a writing from a man who has been through so much. <laughs> Imprisoned, beaten, whipped, stoned. He says, let your love be without hypocrisy. Well, what does he mean by hypocrisy? In the Greek, it means to play act, to wear a mask. 
Now, Paul also tells us later on through his letters to not to be a put-on, but to put on love. We aren't to be hypocrites. Now, I, I know a lot of people say, I don't go to church because I see hypocrites. Well, that's a different thing, all right? We're talking about this is the church. We say we're saved. We say God is my king. We say I'm part of the body of Christ. We're all part of the body of Christ. And yet, at so many times, we do not open up to each other. And we have to question that. What is that? The church should be one unified body. Now, I'm not saying that we need to get everyone up here. You all need to say all your sins and say everything about yourself in front of the whole crowd. I'm saying if you don't have somebody in the body of Christ that's speaking into you or you're speaking to, why not? There's freedom when you take the mask off and throw it down. That's what Paul's telling us. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Don't let your love be fake. Let it be genuine. So we have to ask ourselves, what's Paul talking about? What does love look like? What does the body of Christ look like? What should we look like? Well, it says here in 1 John, glad you asked. 1 John chapter 4, 7 and 8. It says, Beloved, let us want love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God. Here it is, for God is love. That is such a powerful thing. We used to have a little magnet on our fridge, I remember years ago. I don't know where it went, but God is love. Three little, three little words, powerful. <clears throat> we live in a time now where people say love is love. That doesn't even make sense. It's redundant. It's like saying pizza is pizza. <clears throat> What's that supposed to mean? Love is love. I'm not trying to be sar I'm a little sarcasm, but it's like, seriously, I mean, they never take an English class? I mean, what are you doing? God is love. That brings a whole new meaning to it. That was actually the original meaning. Someone's trying to change it, and we got to come back to the original meaning, don't we? We as the church don't need to argue with them about their wording and their sentence structures. We need to reflect who he is. If God is love, we need to be love. If God is love, we need to be love. Love apart from God is not genuine. True love, agape love, which means no matter what you do to me, I will seek only good towards you. No matter what my boss did to me, <clears throat> I had to learn <clears throat> to drink water when I can't breathe, and to do good, regardless of what his decision was to me. It's so hard. It is. It's hard. Being a Christian's hard. It is. Let's be real. Because God expects us to do what he wrote. There's the hard part. Well, we can come into church, sit here, just clap our hands and listen to the message, give a good amen, go home and pretend we never saw it or heard it and did it and just live our life. That is not what God has called us to. If you're called into a kingdom, you're called in to live under a king, and you are called to live like a king and look like a king. What if I'm a woman? Okay, you look like a queen. You know what I'm saying. We're to live as he lived. Now, that doesn't mean we, once again, how do I get from point A to point B? Suffering. That's how you get to point B. Now, suffering for him, you don't have to go line up. Get a, you don't have to find a line. There's no ministry you're going to call the office. Hey, I'd like to get on the suffering ministry. Yeah. <clears throat> Pastor Jody can be over that one. <clears throat> you aren't going to find that. God will find you. He knows where you are. He knows what you need. He knows what he needs to squeeze out of you to fill you again. This isn't a fun message, is it? <clears throat> I, don't like it when he, I don't like it when he talks about stuff like this. Go home, Pastor Steve. Listen to this. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 4 through 8. <clears throat> this is, a ver this is a de the definition of love, but it's also the attributes of God. So you could literally exchange the word love for God because this is who God is. 
It says, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not pray to itself. It's not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked, and it thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but it rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things, and it endures all things. What does it bear? It bears under all the stresses and the temp all the things, the temptations, the suffering. It believes in the Word of God. It believes in the words, the promises that God has given to us. And that's where our, our hope is, in Christ. And it endures because we can persevere through Christ, through love. When you have God's love come into you, you will be surprised what you can endure. The problem is, is we don't want to endure anything. <laughs> we want a life of vacation. <clears throat> vacation. And that's not what we're called to. We're called to endure. The only way he's going to get what's in you out and put back into you what he wants is to squeeze you. Do you get that envisionment now like a lemon or something? Yeah? It's pleasant, isn't it? It's lemony. Romans 12, verse 10 through 13, it says, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. He has got a list going here. I forgot one part of my last scripture is love never fails. That could actually fit. That, that fits for Romans 12, what I just read. If love never fails, then we can be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. Honor each other. Don't lag in what you're supposed to be doing. Diligence. We should be a people of excellence. Striving for, to serve the Lord. In, not, not so I look better than you and he looks better than her, but what can I do to honor God? First and foremost. And you know what? If that's cleaning toilets, you clean that toilet the best you can. You make that baby shine. If you do everything for the Lord, it matters because that's a change in your heart. Do you need people to honor you or do you want to honor other people? Let's see this. What? There's different ways we can honor people. Honoring others. Honoring others to receive something such as like an employee to an employer or an employer to an employee. There's a reward system and that's okay because that's how that works, right? You work, they take care of you. We honor one another. That's nice. There's something you get. But when you come into the kingdom, <clears throat> we aren't honoring people to get some coin. <laughs> we don't honor each other to get recognition. We honor people because it's to honor God. You and I are made in the image of God. God honored us when we didn't even deserve it. I'm blown away by this picture right here. When he was hanging on the cross, <clears throat> after everything that took place in him, being just thrashed, I mean, I can't even imagine him walking. The description that has taken place, everything that has happened to his body, I, I, just the, I cringe at the thought of him, I mean, getting up and being exposed to the air with your organs almost really hanging out. And here he is, they throw him onto a cross. I mean, just... The cruelty and the, I, I don't know, there's no words to describe that. But here he is hanging up, and he's looking down, and you'll find this, it's only in the Gospel of John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. It says he looks down as he's got spikes in his hands, all this torment, all this, not to mention sins of the world. I've tried carrying my sins before, and they're heavy. I'm not built for it, neither are you. I can't fathom what that would be to take on the sins of everyone. And here he is hanging. Here he is about to go. He's about to go back to the Father. He looks down and he says, Woman, behold your son. Behold your mother. Even in the time where he's about to pass and he has all this thrown on him, he's more concerned about honoring his mother 
Because that's what he's supposed to do. You honor your mother and your father. What an honor it would have been for John to take on Mary, the mother of the Christ. He turns to a thief next to him. And he counsels him. He ministers to him. He says, you're coming with me. If he can do that in that situation, why can't we, in our small suffering, look out for the, our brother and sister next to us? If you are, excellent. If it's something you need to grow in, do it. God wants you to grow. There's one way the people, the community, sees us as the church. There's supposed to be one way. They're supposed to see Christ. It says that they'll know we're Christians by our love. We sing that song. It's not talking about our love. It's not talking about how I want to love you or how you want to love me. It's we'll be known as Christians because we love exactly like him. We have the mind of Christ. We're supposed to be of one mind. But that doesn't mean that, oh, yeah, okay, so we have the church of God mind. No, we go to the church of God building. We're to have the mind of Christ and think like him. It's one unified body, and that takes time. That doesn't happen overnight. We have to learn, each one of us has to learn to allow to God to squeeze you, to squeeze out of you what's still in you, to fill you, to squeeze you, to squeeze me, to get it out, to get it in. The thing is, is will we allow him? That's God calling right now. That was for you. Did you answer? Romans 12, 14 says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. That's one of the lessons I learned the original story when I started. Because my first thought wasn't pleasant. Focused more probably on the cursing part. But I learned how to love and to bless him. I blessed him when I left. That's weird to me when I think about it because I know me. And then I watch that happen. And I look and I go, that, that's just you. That is so weird to watch God function in your life when you know that's not how you're built, when that's not who, how you're wired. It's wonderful to watch God get right inside you and change you. Let's let him. Let's all of us let him. <laughs> Bless who, those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Even once again, he's, on the, he's hanging on the tree and he's looking out. They're all mocking him. They're calling him names. They're jeering at him. He didn't say one negative thing to them. You know, you would think he'd go, you know what, taking names, looking at faces, I'm going to remember you when you're standing before me in judgment. He didn't say that. He says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Now, if those people repented, I'll guarantee you, when he sees them, he'll embrace them. To have that kind of empathy that kind of gen, gen, generosity towards those. That's what we're supposed to. That's us. That's what we're called to do for each other. Well, you don't know what that one did. I don't need to know what other people do. I've done stupid things in life. Every one of us have done stupid things. Every one of us have been rude. Every one of us have been selfish. We all live on the same playing field. But God's called us to a different kingdom. And he's called us to love each other. I've met people who find it easier to love people who are across the country or across the world. I've met people who, in the church, not this church, who just claimed about how they just love this people group, and yet he couldn't love the people right in front of him. Well, how easy that is when you have no investment. This is hard work. If you want to be Christ, you be Christ here first. This is the house. These are your people. This is the body. And if you can't love these people, well, we need to get squeezed some more. <laughs> Romans 12, 15, and 16, it says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. Don't set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. 
Do not be wise in your own opinion. We need to learn to be sensitive to others' needs, to look around. I know sometimes, you know, there's nothing worse than if you, somebody had just passed and somebody comes in just scream, woo, man, yeah, what do you think? You know, be sensitive to your surroundings. Look for people to minister to. I guess there's another mindset. Do you come in here looking for who's going to give me what I need? Or do you come in and go, who can I pour out on? I'm looking for you. I got target, target five. I'm, there they are. And you go in and you just love on them. And you teach them and they go home and they've been loved. And they tell people. And then you go target four and you go over and you love on them. Because that's our mindset. We gather here to worship God, to hear the word of God, but to also to love the people of God. And sometimes people who neglect to come, some people have reasons. I'm not, I'm not accusing anyone. I'm just saying, they say, I don't like to come to church because of this and that. You're missing out. Or I can be the body of Christ at home. You, you're not part of the body when you're not here. You're, you're, un, you're unsafe. You're not getting squeezed, and you're not getting loved, and you're not bringing something that somebody here needed. We all need each other. Have I made that clear? I think I made that clear. Because God's made it clear in my life. If you've ever felt insignificant, unimportant, overlooked, looked through, which I have. Allow God to squeeze you because you're being lied to because you're not insignificant. Some people may look over you and look right through you, but there are others that want to minister to you because that person who looked through you may not be where they need to be spiritually yet. You know, we got to quit judging each other because someone did this or did that and I don't know why they did that. I don't know why. Maybe they're just immature. Some people are very immature in their faith. Some people could be and going to church for 30 years and still immature in their faith. You've got to allow God to squeeze you. We've got to grow with each other. Then we can go with each other. We have the love of God, the mind of Christ, and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. I can't think of anything better. I can't think of, I, I can't think of anything else I need. I know I could li we could give a list of temporary things. <laughs> yes. I could give a list of temporary things that I need. But as far as for the eternal and to get through this life, I don't need anything else. Neither do you. Utilize the gifts God has given you now, today. We share in his sufferings. We share in his riches. But we also share the same thing with each other as well. I guess this, what this really is, is today, is just a call out to the body of Christ of not just getting to know each other. It's not just, hey, you play cribbage? I like cribbage too. <laughs> yeah, here comes the sarcasm. It's getting to know each other. What scares you? Let me pray for you. And then, doot, 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 doot. how are you doing? I've been praying for you today. How are you doing? I'm not doing well. Hold on. Everything's great. Oh, wait. I'm struggling. And I need you. Please pray for me. In fact, if you have 10 minutes, can you come over and pray for me? We got to get real. I'm not saying nobody's real. <laughs> Use cliches, but... We got to get serious with each other if we aren't already. We should know each other and be known. Isn't that what we say about God? We should be that way with each other as well. I want to know you and I want you to know me. Transparency, vulnerable, finding someone you can trust and opening your heart to them so you can grow. So when you are getting squeezed, you have someone to fall back on with as well. Does that make sense? Let's pray. 
<laughs> Father, we're just thanking you so much that we're part of you. We're part of your kingdom. Father, every one of us here who have called on your name and are saved, Father, we have so much to be thankful to you for. So much. We do want to thank you as well for the sufferings that we have learned from. Maybe it's just today's the day that they can turn it around and see exactly what you're doing, Lord. That you're growing them. That if they're suffering for no reason, you're growing them. You're pruning. You're growing. You're bringing them into your image. We were all created to, to bear your image. We're all created. Jesus walked the face of the earth. He was the, he was the visible image of the invisible God. And though we are not Christ, we are little Christ. We are to bear his image as well. And we are being made into his image day after day through trial, through experience, through suffering, through joy, and through togetherness. So, Father, it's you we rejoice with today, that you allow these things to happen, that you will care for us enough to love us through all these things. Through all of our complaining, through all of our griping, we exchange it, Lord, for rejoicing and praising. And we lift our hands to you and give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah.